listen carefully. I'm telling you the truth about what I know, have seen, and experienced, with my own eyes even. But still, you won't believe. It was necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up on a cross. In order that everyone who believes in him, and cleaves to him, trusts him, may not be destroyed, but have a real life, eternal life, and actually live forever. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he gave up his unique and only Son. So that whoever trusts in and clings to, relies on and believes in him, will not perish, but have eternal, everlasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his Son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad they were. He came to help. He came to help. He came to help to put the world right again. This is what I believe. This is what I believe. This is what I believe. What do you believe? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, good, uh, good question. And we want to ask that question this morning, um, all throughout this uh, service, is what do you believe? What do I uh, really believe? And this is a really important question. Uh, I don't know if you've thought about it a whole lot, but it's so important. What do I really, really believe? And this is huge because this question really points to who we are. Uh, it points and gets at what we do. And uh, people have been asking this question and have been asked this question for a long, long time. And so we're going to spend this morning talking about belief. And uh, it's just our prayer that uh, the Spirit is very clear on uh, what uh, He wants us to know uh, when it comes uh, to what we really believe. Do we really believe? And that we'll be able to answer that question uh, when we leave this, this place this morning, this gathering. I'm going to pray, if that's cool with you, one more time and then... Um, and we'll jump into this. Father, uh, we thank you for this gathering. I thank you, Father, for each person uh, in this place right now that you've brought. I, I know God, and, and I remind them that they're not here by accident, uh, that, that they're loved and cherished and known by you. And I thank you, um, God, for bringing us all here together. And uh, we praise you for that. Holy Spirit, I know that uh, you're here and that uh, you're in us as, as followers, as we've given our lives to you, that uh, you've filled us up. And so I pray that you just um, really uh, make that known to us now, um, if you haven't yet, that we would hear and we know that you convict and you comfort and you encourage and you do all these things as we get into your word that uh, it would be very clear um, what it is you want us to know. I pray that you would speak, not me. Pray, Father, that if, uh, if any of us in this room have um, maybe fallen for some lies, that you would make that known to us this morning. If, if we've, maybe we've believed some twists in the truth, that uh, you would uh, kick those out right now as we get into what you've written, what you've had your people write, inspired by you, your word. God, we believe it to be absolute truth that is true for every single one of us and all those all over this planet, all those you've created. So may we, we land in that. May we, when we stand in that and, and spirit, please, please do what you need to do in us now. That you would receive glory, that you'd receive the honor um, for all these things. And we just pray these things in your mighty name. Amen. All right. Belief. Uh, or believing in something is all over the place. Whether we kind of pay attention to it or not, um, we're just kind of thinking about this idea of belief, uh, even in, in our culture, not just in church, but, but all around us. And so I got to thinking about some songs that have been written about belief. And there are lots of them. I um, just want to kind of share a few with you that I, I thought of off the top of my head. Anyone here, um, <clears throat> by raise of hand, uh, around in the 1960s? Raise your hand. I'm not going to raise my hand. I was not. 1960, some of you are brave, okay? Braver than others. I see you out there. You are lying. Okay. Uh, there's, a, there's a band. Uh, there was a band uh, called The Lovin' Spoonful. Anybody remember these guys? They wrote a song that says, Do you believe in magic? Hey, good. Some of you are awake. Good. You remember that song. Uh, 
here's another one. And, and this is actually like this. These guys uh, have some of their stuff on my own iPod. Same era. Uh, everyone remember the monkeys? Yeah. I'm a believer. Remember that song? Yeah, awesome song, okay? I'm a believer. Now we're going to jump to the 1980s. Big hair, lots of hair. Anybody a child of the 1980s? Yes. Some of us, our hair has left the building, but we're, we're here. Great band, Journey. Don't stop believing. You got to sing it. You can't just say it. Sing it, okay? Don't stop believing. Okay, let's, let's do another one. Let's jump up to 1990s. And I, I'm not really familiar with this guy a whole lot, but I do know the song. I'm sure if you listen to the pop radio, you'll recognize this song. His name is R. Kelly, and he's saying this. I believe I can... I can believe I can touch the sky. Remember that song? Okay, good. All right, here's another good one. Share. <laughs> she wrote a song, if you can remember this, this actually didn't come out that long ago, about believe, it's called Believe, and she sang it like this. Do you believe in love after love? <laughs> huh? <laughs> you remember that song? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's my best share imitation. Um, boy, yeah, right. If I could turn back time. Okay. Here's another one. This, this is down uh, some of our alleys a little bit more, mine a little bit more, a uh, band called Poison. And uh, they sang a song called uh, Something to Believe In. Remember this? Give me something to believe in. Remember that song? Okay. And uh, the great question, and, and even the lyrics in that, someone's searching. Uh, and there's so many more uh, that we could rattle off, but we're not going to spend all day naming that tune. Um, so what is belief? Uh, what is it? And really this week, spent a lot of time um, looking at what, it, what does it mean to believe? Uh, what is belief? More importantly this morning, what is biblical belief? Uh, when it comes to our lives as we've gathered in this place, um, in his name, what is biblical belief? So really, to, to, to kind of kick that off as, as I looked at that, um, it's really to have faith in. It was interesting. As you look at what biblical belief is, it's closely linked with faith, hand in hand with faith. Uh, it means to trust in, okay, to believe in it. I have faith, right? I'm trusting in it. Um, again, Dad, Dad touched on this uh, last week, and I just kind of want to continue to where, where he, he left that. Um, believing, really believing, is more than just a mental I believe. It's more than just, yeah, I believe that, all right? Because a lot of people believe stuff, all right? Um, it's more than just a mental assent. Real, true, biblical belief means movement. It leads to action. Real belief means to move. It means to change. It is faith lived out. And that word believe linked with faith uh, all throughout scripture. Uh, go to James in uh, chapter two. I just wanna, wanna read this as we open, open this up just to kind of give us an a, a idea scripturally here. Um, belief, faith. Listen to what uh, verses um, 14 through 19 say. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith <clears throat> but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is what? It's dead. It's dead. Belief, true belief, faith means movement. Means action. Again, many, many, many people say, I believe. I mean, you go out on the street, uh, and you can say, hey, uh, do, you, do, you know, do you believe in God? Yeah, I believe, I believe there's a God. Do you believe there's, yeah, you know, I, I believe in Jesus. And a lot will say, I believe. But we can take a look at a lot of lives and see not a lot of fruit there. It's easy to say, I believe. But, 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 but is there movement in their lives? Is there fruit? Is there any evidence that they really do truly believe? Anybody here remember when you first 
came to know Christ or you first like, you, you kind of, yes, I do believe that. You guys remember that? Anybody remember that very clearly? Um, uh, my life uh, just got me thinking about this and, and I'm not gonna go into a whole lot here. Um, but I, I grew up in this church. Um, a, lot of, a lot of you know that. Um, I was a PK. Obviously, a lot of you know that. Um, and so, as a PK and a church kid, a lot of you, you can relate to this. That's just what you grew up believing, right? You know, Jesus is who he says he is. He came, he died. And, and I believe that growing up. Um, and, but I believe uh, as I grew up and as I grew up in this, um, it was just a lot of up here belief. Um, I don't know if I would call it real true biblical belief. I had moments of that uh, where I, I seemed to understand it and God would speak to me and I'd go, oh man, yeah. And, and I would believe. Um, but I remember distinctly when I really truly believed. Uh, and I was 22 years old. Um, and now I, I was in Bible college, uh, which is a funny place to go if you're really, you know, you, I guess you're trying to figure things out. Um, I was 22 in Bible college uh, when I remember distinctly, clearly, I, it's crazy to even think about this, going back uh, that long ago, I remember when I believed, really, truly. And I, you know how I know the difference? It changed me. It changed my life. Growing up, I believed up here, you know, here and there, hit and miss. When I was 22 and God finally, you know, I, I, I listened or he smacked me, sometimes I need that and my eyes were open, it changed me. I moved and I have never gone back to that and I never will. It's, there's a difference between, oh, I believe, and belief, true belief. God is so good. And, and so this morning, one point, that's it, as we kick this off, uh, we start with believe uh, in this series. And, and that is this. And, and God keeps bringing this up. This isn't the first time we've heard this. Really, it's not the first time we've talked about this in the last several years. Um, God keeps bringing this up over and over. And I'm just gonna be honest with you, it's gonna come up more, okay? Especially as we move through believe, belong, become. This is a thread uh, that will, will make its way through all of this. But here's the main point. May God uh, please help us uh, uh, let this sink in. Let this change our lives. Okay, here it is. True belief brings about movement. You could say it like this. Real belief brings about change. True belief brings action into our lives. It brings about movement. Belief is a powerful, powerful thing. It is so powerful. If you stop and think about this, the power of belief, all right? Go back several years. The power of belief led some guys to hijack a plane and fly into the Twin Towers on 9-11. The power of belief. Think about that. The power of belief led a guy with a short little mustache kill millions of Jews because he believed in something. Power of belief. And I thought, man, that led, that's led to wars. It's led to all kinds of crazy stuff. The, the power of belief. But then we got to thinking about this, and then this one popped into, into my head. Anyone familiar with the Saint family in the 1950s, Nate Saint? There's a movie, uh, I believe it's about them, called The End of the Spear. So if you want to know more, go watch that movie. It's a great movie. But it's about a, a missionary family who left their home, and they went to uh, Ecuador, I believe, in the 1950s. And to minister uh, to the native people there in Ecuador. Nate Saint was killed for his faith by the people there. Um, gave up his life for what he believed in, for the gospel. He literally, okay, here's a good example. It moved him. His beliefs moved him. Action. And he died for his faith. Gave up his faith. Or gave up his life for his faith. Uh, what's even crazier than that is his family stayed there. His wife stayed there and ministered to the very people, shared the gospel, loved the very people that took the life of her husband. Incredible. And won that man to the Lord. She believed. They believed. It moved them. Are you with me? Uh, just a couple weeks ago, we were talking about this in the office. The power of the belief. Uh, we had a high school uh, small group uh, spend their own money, go out and spend their own money in buying some, some supplies for a family in our community who had a fire a few weeks ago. It's the power of belief. It moved them to do something. They acted on it. High school kids, 
doing ministry. Isn't that awesome? The power of belief. It leads us to help, uh, to help reach out to those on the fringes of society, to show them love, to show them uh, that they're needed and cherished and loved in Jesus' name. The power of belief is a powerful thing and there are so many places in scripture uh, this week as, as I read through that word belief, so many places we could go, so many areas in which we could, we could land on, uh, but we really settled on the life of Paul because we see uh, that power in, in Paul's life. The Apostle Paul, as we go through the next few weeks, it's pretty cool to see, believe, belong, and and what he became. And, And we're excited to keep going in this because his testimony is incredible. His history that we have here that we can see and read. Now, if you're not familiar with Paul, uh, Paul was formerly known as Saul, okay? Uh, he was called Saul. So if you're not, if you've never heard this, I'm going to use Saul and then we're going to use Paul a little, the same dude, okay? He, he was Saul and then when God got a hold of him, Jesus interrupted things and changed things around. Um, he was called Paul. Same guy. So I just, I don't want to confuse anyone there. Um, but here we see in the life of Saul, before he became Paul, we see this guy, when he believed in something, he really believed in it, okay? He, he, he gave everything to it. Um, his beliefs moved him uh, where he was at. Now, now Paul, or Saul, actually shows up in Acts chapter 7 uh, and at the end of Acts chapter 8. And what was going on was the church was growing and uh, there was a man named Stephen where we see this show, where we see Saul show up who had stood up before the the Jewish leaders, presented the gospel, uh, gave his testimony, his incredible thing and what the leaders do is they get ticked off, they get angry and they stone him, throw big rocks at him until he dies. Now, scripture says that there was a man named Saul who stood there holding the coats, the robes of the men who were chunking rocks at Stephen. Saul was there in Acts chapter 8 verse 1 says that and Saul was there giving approval to his death. He was there watching this follower of Jesus be killed, giving approval Now, this was a crazy time for the church. Uh, This first part, as the church sprang up. Uh, Let's read a little bit more. Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. It says, And Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all, except the apostles, were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. Here we go, verse 3. But Saul began to what? destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. All right, everyone meet Saul. That's who we're talking about this morning. All right, that's, that's, it's an incredible history. That's how we get introduced to this dude named Saul. Not a real good guy, especially if you were a follower of Jesus. You did not want to run in to Saul. So again, try to imagine the atmosphere that's going on here in Jerusalem at this time in our history and try to imagine as Jewish leaders, all right, the fury they felt when the church, these followers of the way were growing and growing and growing. This movement was growing by the thousands. And what these guys had tried to do is crucify Jesus. That was to be the end of this uprising. That was to be the end of this movement. Let's crucify Jesus, the false Messiah in their minds. We won't hear anything more about it. It will be done. Did that work? No. It did not work at all. It totally backfired. And we know three days later, Christ rose from the dead, appeared to his disciples, and the church took off when the Holy Spirit came and indwelled. So as the church grew, man, put yourself, try, try, I know it's hard, but try to put yourself in their, in their sandals. They, they were frustrated, okay? They were doing their best to squash this. And it wasn't working. They were, they were arresting these guys. They were putting them in prison. They were flogging them. They were whipping them. They were doing anything they could to silence 
these followers of Jesus, and what did it do? Made them more vocal, made them more courageous, and even more bold. Praise God we have his spirit. It's incredible what happened. And it ticked them off to no end. They were so angry, so mad, and Saul was in the middle of it all in the Jewish leadership. So for him, this would have been so frustrating. So He would have been so angry because he believed in his heart that Jesus was the false Messiah. This was a crazy time in history. And in our church history, go to Acts chapter 9. We're going we're gonna to get jump into this. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 2. So this is what's all happening. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. That's not a good thing. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, which, which is the church, followers of Christ, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Okay, now, we have to remember who Saul is. Uh, Saul was uh, uh, the Jew of Jews. Saul was highly educated, all right? Uh, he was so smart. Saul was, the, was a master of Jewish history and of law. Saul would have started his training uh, as a very young boy. He was trained by the masters. One of those we're going to read about a little bit later. His name was Gamaliel. Okay, highly respected in the Jewish community. Very, very smart. Very intelligent. Saul was very cunning. On his way up the ladder. All right? In, in the Jewish court system, they called the Sanhedrin. I mean, he was on his way up. Doing great things in their eyes. Very successful at what he was doing. And he believed, again, wholeheartedly in the direction of the Jewish leaders that we need to extinguish the followers of the way, the followers of Jesus, of Nazareth. We've got to get rid of them. So here in Acts chapter 9, uh, we just read that, that uh, he was getting letters. He was going to travel up to Damascus uh, to get these followers of Jesus and then bring them back. So, so here in a second, we're going to see this, but he's going to travel up to Damascus and then grab as many as he can and bring them back to Jerusalem for trial to imprison them. Now, do you know how far Damascus is from Jerusalem? Off the top of your head. Does anybody know that? I learned this this week. I didn't know it either. 140 miles roughly, from Jerusalem to Damascus. So Silas and I were kind of thinking about this in the office earlier. That's, and I've Googled this, okay? That's like us leaving New London on foot, all right? right? They didn't have cars, motorcycles, mopeds, motor scooters, okay? On foot and walking to Des Moines. That's is about 145 miles to Des Moines, according to Google Maps, Okay? From us going to Des Moines, 140 miles. That's how much Saul believed in what he was doing. Christians had fled from Jerusalem because of the persecution, what was going on, and they had fled all throughout as far as Damascus, 140 miles away. So how bad does Paul want to get rid of those who follow Jesus? Really bad. To walk 140 miles arrest them, and then haul them back 140 miles again. The power of belief. Charles Swindoll says this, according to Josephus, who was a historical writer in those days, at one point in history, 10,000 Jews were massacred in Damascus. Hard evidence uh, that at certain times, a significant number of Jewish people lived in that city. Saul had the census, census figures too. He knew many Jewish turncoats had fled Israel's capital to seek refuge in faraway Damascus. He devised an aggressive plan to swarm the city, capture the infidels, and drag them into court. And then he says this, Thankfully, God had a different plan. Go back to Acts. Let's keep, it, keep going. Verse 3. I'm going to read 3 through 9 and then stop there. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? 
Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. So Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. And for three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. All right. So, so we've been introduced to Saul, or what his mission was. Now we see an interruption by who? Jesus. Okay? He, Jesus is good at this. He interrupts things, doesn't he? Anyone been interrupted? Yeah. It's, it's awesome. Okay? But that, that's, that's what he does. Now again, try to imagine being Saul here. You're so intent. You believe so much in what you're doing. You're traveling to Damascus to gather all these Christians, to arrest them, bring them back to Jerusalem. With everything you have, you believe what you're doing is right. You've been taught. You've been trained your whole life. Then imagine that all this, your whole life, everything you thought you believed is, is blown away in a moment. Gone. Not true. False. Fake. Maybe some of us have been there before. It's been that extreme. Your, your, your encounter with Christ has just taken your life that you thought was right and just went boom and blew it up, right? And it set you on another path. That's what happened to Saul here. Imagine that. Everything you believed, gone. And this Jesus, as he's on the road to Damascus and he falls, and this Jesus is not dead. He's alive. And this Jesus is not the false Messiah like I've believed and like I've been taught this whole time. This Jesus is the true Messiah. And all that changes in that moment. The one he hated reached out to him. The one he hated called his name, not only once, but twice. How incredible is that? The one he hated reached out and showed mercy and grace and love. Can you imagine? We read that Saul went into Damascus and he stayed for how long? Three days, blind. Can you imagine the thoughts that were going through Saul's mind as he waited for three days in darkness? We can read through this and just read. Oh, he stayed there for three days. He was blind and we keep going. Stop and think about that. Three days he was blind, interrupted by Jesus. What was going on in his mind? What was Saul feeling? Now, I don't know for sure, but, but I'm willing to bet if we put ourselves in his situation for a moment, I bet while he was waiting, because there wasn't specific instructions, just go and wait and, we'll, and I'll tell you what you're going to do. I bet he felt guilty. I, I just, I'm just going to suggest that. I bet there was tons of guilt there. Shame. Can you imagine laying there blind, Jesus interrupting your life, everything you've lived for, everything you've done, all those people you've hurt, all those people who've been killed and executed because you arrested them because it, it was you that did it and you were wrong. You did it. What did they die for? And can you imagine the guilt and the shame as he lay there blind, waiting for word. What have I done? What have I done, Lord? Can you imagine that? I, I'm guessing that, 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 and again, this is just a guess, but I'm guessing there's a little bit of fear there. Again, he didn't get a lot of, a lot of instruction. You know, just go wait. Can you, he, what is Jesus gonna do to me? <laughs> That's what I'd be thinking. Look what I've done. Oh, man. What are they going to do to me? What's he going to do to me? I've, I've imprisoned and killed so many of his followers. I'm in big trouble. I don't know what the Greek word for poo is, but that's what he would be saying. Okay? Something like dookie, probably. Sounds Greek. That's what I'm in. I'm in that. What am I, I going to do? Imagine lying in there for three days in the dark. Saul's whole belief system has been turned upside down. I don't know who said this, but listen to this. It says, it hurts more to have a belief pulled than to have a tooth pulled. And no intellectual Novocaine is available. Man, just pulled, pulled out. 
totally rocked. Now, now let, let's keep reading. Look, look at 10 through 19. In Damascus, there was a man, a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he had seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from your chief pri or from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry out my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and he entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, what's he say? Brother Saul, okay? We'll talk about that in a second. The Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and, f and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Now, here's the danger because I don't want to go too far here because we're going to get into to next week is belong and I don't want to go too far. So next week, we're going to talk about some of the same stuff, I think. So, so uh, I don't want to go too far, but there's some really cool stuff here. Um, Saul's instructed to go to Damascus. He does. He's laying there. Uh, he's blind. And then we see this Ananias show up, right? Uh, this, new, this new guy. And this is pretty cool, okay? Ananias, it calls him a disciple. Ananias was a, a follower. And what did God ask Ananias to go do? Go to Saul and lay your hands on him. Okay, I want you to go to where he's at. I want you to lay your hands on him and pray with him. Now, what was Ananias' response? <laughs> what? Yeah, I, I, was, I was reading some of these, and, and I just want to read to you um, a few scriptures we just read, but I want to read it from the message. Now, the message is not a translation. It's a paraphrase, but we can kind of get the, the idea of maybe what Ananias was thinking when God said, hey, I want you to go to Saul. Listen to what the message says, 9, 9 uh, 13 through 14. Ananias protested, Master, you can't be serious. Everybody's talking about this man and the terrible things he's been doing, his reign of terror against your people in Jerusalem. And now he's shown up here with papers from the chief priests that give him license to do the same to us. You want me to go to who? Are you serious? You want me to go to Saul? Now again, try to put yourself here in, in, in Ananias' place. Knowing who Saul is. He, he would have heard, we obviously know that, what he's been doing. Now, we're not told, uh, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't know why Ananias is in Damascus. We know he's a follower, he's a disciple. Maybe Ananias fled Jerusalem. I don't know. Maybe he's hiding as well, and then God says, go see Saul. Go to him and, and visit him. Now, think about this. Again, we can read it and go, that's cool, big deal, so what? You know, awesome. Okay, but that would, be, that would be like God saying, hey, you know what, Brandon, I want you to get on a plane and I want you to fly overseas and I want you to seek out the leader of ISIS and I want you to lay hands on him and I want you to pray for him. How, what would you do? You know what I would do? Here comes, Brian. I would tinkle. <laughs> That's how serious this is. It, imagine being, being Jewish in 1940s and God were to seek you out and say, listen, I want you to travel to Berlin and I want you to make your way to Berlin and I want you to pray and to talk to Adolf Hitler. Guys, that's what that would have been like for Ananias. This was no small thing that we read about. This was huge for this man. This was huge for Ananias. What did he do? He goes. He obeys. Here we see, not, we not only see Saul's journey in coming to believe, we see Ananias here as an example of true belief. He moves. He acts. And I got to thinking about this scripture and, and this scene. What an example to Saul you imagine, man, that guy, he had to have been scared. 
still, he goes, but he had to have been scared. As he makes his way into where Saul was at, can you imagine what some of the conversations were after this as Ananias spent some time with him, what they talked about? You know, Ananias had been like, shoo, I was so scared, man. I didn't know what you were going to do to me. I didn't know, if, you know, I, it was scary. You've done all these things. Can you imagine this exchange that Saul and Ananias had? And I can only imagine that Saul admired the courage of Ananias as he laid there. Man, that's incredible. You believe that much, that you, that you trust Christ that much, God that much, knowing what I've done, that you would come. What, what an encouragement and what an example Ananias was to Saul and to us as well. True belief. True belief. I want to read verses 17 through 19 again. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, again, what did he say? Brother Saul. That's incredible. He called him brother. The Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me to you that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Now, I want to go back to Saul. Okay, in verse 18 it says, and Saul could see again. I love that picture. It says something like scales fell from his eyes. Saul could really see. Probably for the first time, really. As those scales fell from his eyes, Saul saw who Jesus is and his call on his life. Man, it's incredible stuff. And we know that Saul was turned to Paul and it was never the same again. Never the same again. He truly believed. And we see Saul turn to Paul, move. And we're gonna go there in the next few weeks, so keep coming back, keep reading ahead. We see him move and do incredible things for the kingdom of God. Incredible things. In Jesus' name, how awesome is that what Jesus did in his life? In Jesus' name, he went on to do these things. And we see all throughout Scripture, and I want to read some of these, Saul, Paul, share his story, who he was, sharing his testimony to those who would listen, uh, to, to let them know the power of Christ, to let them know the mercy and the love and the forgiveness of who Jesus is, that Jesus is the true Messiah, the Savior of the world, and he changed my life. This is who I was. And this is what he's made me. Let's just read some of these. Acts 22, 1 through 5. Listen to what he says to, uh, oops, I skipped ahead, a crowd uh, that he's talking to. Uh, Acts 22. 1 through 5. Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cecilia. Cecilia. Cilicia. Hi, Cecilia. Brought up uh, in this city under Gamaliel. There's Gamaliel. Okay? Very respected man. They would have recognized that name. I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of the way, of this way, to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. As also the high priest and all the council can testify, I even obtained letters from them to their uh, brothers in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. Then he goes on to give the testimony of what we just read. He shares that with, with this crowd of people. Go, back, go to chapter 26 as he's talking to Agrippa. This is incredible. The boldness and, and the belief in Paul and it grips his heart to move in the name of Jesus. Acts 26, verses 9 through 11. He says this to Agrippa. I too was convinced that uh, I ought to do all that was possible to oppress the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. The power of belief, the power of Christ in a changed life. 
that brings about movement, action, change. Let's look at some of his letters. Galatians 1, 13 through 14. Listen to what he writes to the Galatians. For you have heard of my previous way of life in in Judaism. How intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Remember, that's where he was. 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 14. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength that he ordered or that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I once was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with a faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. I love this one, Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Listen to Paul's testimony here. Not that I have already obtained all of this or have I already uh, arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, listen to this, forgetting what is behind. Remember who's writing this, right? Remember who we're talking about. This is Saul, turn to Paul. Forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me and have a word in Christ Jesus. Belief. Movement. I'm forgetting what's behind me and I'm pressing on towards the goal. True, biblical belief. It brings about movement. And we see Paul really, truly believe. So as we close, I want to ask some, some questions. In, in the light of, of what we just Seen, what we've just heard about, about Saul uh, turning to Paul and, and his life, even looking at Ananias, and, and this hit me this morning, early service, uh, maybe we should have went here, even looking at the early church, those Christians believed. That's what gave them the courage to stand up, you know, in front of the Sanhedrin, in front of these leaders who had their lives in their hands and, and proclaimed the gospel. They believed, they moved, they acted in the light of them, in the light of Ananias moving to talk to Saul, in the light of Saul turning to Paul and, and, and listening and moving and acting. In the light of all those things, I just want to ask a few questions. And I want to go back. Uh, and I want to have, uh, if we can... Just a morning and a time of, of a gut check. And I don't even know if gut check's the word, but, but a, a heart evaluation time for us. As, as a room full, most of us, if not all of us, I don't know everybody here, but a room full of, of believers, okay? Gut check, heart check right here. I want to go back to that first question because true belief is more about the heart than it is up here. Okay, remember, it's more than a mental ascent. It's a heart thing. Do I really believe? In the light of Scripture, what we just read. In the light of the lives who've been lived in Jesus' name as examples for us of what belief is, real belief. Do I really, truly believe? Biblical belief. Is there any evidence in my life? Any evidence at all? Am I moving? Is there movement in in my relationship with Christ? Is there any conviction? Because again, we're really good at saying it. We're so good at that, I believe. And we just sang it. You know, and even he was listening to this this morning in practice and I was looking at the words and I was thinking, those are dangerous words if we really don't believe. That's really dangerous. In the light of what I've learned this week in studying what belief really is, and we sing that and we're not really, that's dangerous. And we're really good at this. We're really good at talking about it. Are we living it? Are we living it out? And guys, do you really believe biblically and are you living that out in your relationships at home? Are you living out your belief, your faith, and action with your spouse? 
Husbands, are you loving your wife like Christ loved the church? Are you living it out? Wives, are you upholding your end and respecting and honoring your husband and submitting to him to a man who loves you like Christ loves the church? Not that hard if he does that. Are you, are you living it out in your relationships with your kids? With your friends? With your small group? With your guys at work or your gals at work? Is it a part of you? Or do you just believe? I believe. But my friends really don't know I'm a Christian. I don't know if they know. Huh? Guys, that, that not, I'm sorry. That's not belief. I'm just going to call that the way it is. It's not belief. That's just a mental illusion in your mind. Not a belief. According to what real belief is. Are we living it out in our community? I was talking about some of this uh, with, with a good friend of mine this week. And uh, we were just discussing these things and kind of evaluating. Uh, da- it's dad's fault, okay? I'm just going to say this. This is all dad's fault. Uh, last week in his sermon, he said something that really kind of got to me. And so this whole week as I was studying this, this kept coming back. Am I moving? Am I moving forward? What, what, what evidence do I have that... That God is moving in me. And so we got to talking about this, uh, a good friend of mine, and, and this question came up, and he proposed this. And so I, w- I want to ask this question, because maybe it's even a better question than do I believe or do I really believe, because it gets a little bit more deeper, which sometimes is more painful, and I'm just heads up, okay? But it's a good question for us. So maybe the question is, is not for us really, do I really believe, but maybe the question deeper still is, do I want to believe. Again, in the light of what belief is, we just saw that, right? Belief is movement. It's following. There's a desire. There's action. It's not just a bunch of I believe, I believe, it's man, I believe and my life is going. I'm following. I'm moving. I'm acting. Maybe a better question for us is do I want to really believe? Or am I cool with I believe? Or do I want to believe as scary as that can be as much as we struggle with it and we do and that's okay man struggle well that's good struggling means you're not dead yet spiritually struggle awesome we struggle together struggle with that and I, I, I want to encourage you Practically, okay. Right now, I'm gonna try to try to get. I know I'm not always the most practical guy. <laughs> Sometimes I frustrate some of you. Um, here, here's 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 as practical as I can get. Okay. I want you to take these questions, and if you've written them down, awesome. I want you to take these questions, and I want you to go home, or if you drove from Winfield or Fort Madison or wherever you're from, I want you to talk about these questions with your spouse or your kids uh, in your small groups this week. Some of you guys are in your small groups. Talk about these questions. Do I believe? Really, okay? Not, again, not just the yeah, but really. And, and what evidence of that is there in my life? Or deeper, do I, do I find myself wanting to really believe? Do I even want to believe? And discuss that with one another or someone you trust. Because here's what I found out this week and, and spending time with, my, with my, my good friend, really my brother, is I can be my harshest critic. Anybody else? I don't, so dad, again, messed me up last week. I was depressed all week. Am I moving? God, what evidence in my life that, that I'm moving? What have I, have I changed any? And, and all I see, and I'm just speaking for myself, maybe you relate to this, all I see are my shortcomings. All I see are my frustrations and when I get angry, uh, the things I struggle with sin-wise and temptation-wise. That's what I see and that's sometimes what, I, what my mind goes to. And so what was good for me this week was to have someone say, say tell me something differently. And maybe that's what we need to do in our small groups this week is take some time Okay, with people you trust, again, your husband, whoever, your wife, and and say, do you see evidence in me? And then we need to be ready for an answer, okay? (laughs) But lovingly, if it's someone you trust, they're gonna say, they're gonna say yes, or they're gonna say, you know what, I think maybe we've been stuck. Maybe this is where where I can help you 
grow a little bit more or start moving in. I don't know what that looks like for you. I don't know what that's going to be for you. But please, please, please do that this week with someone you trust, someone that loves Jesus like you do, someone that will be honest with you in love so we can move if we're not. So we can take that next step. Remember a few, a month ago or so? Take that next step and then take that next step. Dad asked this question a long time ago. Do, do, do I find myself wanting the benefits of the cross and, and of this relationship with Jesus but I'm not sure I, I desire or really want to, to know Jesus? I'm not sure I really want to move. That's the question. Do I, do I want to, to believe? I'm not sure I want to move. I'm not sure I, I want to act. I'm not sure if I want to. You know, I want to be saved. Does anyone here not want to be saved from hell? Okay. I want to be saved all day long, forever. But Jesus, you're going to ask me to move and do things and you're going to change my life and you're going to turn it upside down in some places and in some areas. I'm not going to think like I did and I might have to give some things up. Um, I'm going to gain a whole bunch of stuff, but I'm not sure... I'm not sure, man. I just want to go to heaven and then I want to live my life here the way I want to. Guys, that is not how it works. And so many of us live our lives like that. I want to be saved. I'm saved. I'm saved all day long. And I'm living a life of hell outside these walls. Churches are full of those. I'm sorry. It's the truth. Here, we need to wake up with the grace of God by His Holy Spirit and we need to get off our keisters and move for the sake of His kingdom because there are people that are lost that you see every day and God has placed you in this place, this circle that only you might be the only one that, 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 that will even give them an example of who Jesus is and God has put you right in the middle. But we believe do we believe? And are we moving? I want to finish up with a quote. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, a uh, great, great guy, says this. Uh, and this is, this is kind of a boom, so just heads up. It's good. So I would recommend you either believe in God up to the hilt or else not to believe at all. Believe in this book of God, every letter of it, or else reject it. There is no logical standing place between the two. Be satisfied with nothing less than a faith that swims in the deeps of divine revelation. A faith that paddles about the edge of the water is poor faith at best. It is little better than dry land faith and it is not good for much. Whew. That's hard hitting. That's hard hitting. But can, I want to say this, and this is how I want to be done. I promise I'm done, okay? The creator, right, of the universe has called your name, just like Saul. The creator of the universe, Jesus Christ, alive today, has called or is calling your name right now this morning, just like he called Saul, he knew Saul's name. He had a plan for Saul. He's got a plan for you. That was Saul's turn. Now guess whose turn is it? Yours and mine. Yours and mine. Saul believed. Will you believe? He's calling your name. Saul believed. Will you believe? Will you do it? I'm going to have you stand. And uh, I don't know if the praise band's back there or not. I thought I heard him. If not, that's cool. We'll just pray. Um, I just want to encourage you, uh, if um, you're at a point of just coming to know the Lord or, or you know, you've never really heard all this before and you've never made a decision um, but you believe and you're ready to move forward in that, um, please come forward um, afterwards and I'll stay up here. I know dad's around. I see Kevin back there. There's people around um, that can help, help you with that. Um, we just read one example here, right here. We have it all over the place in here. It says Paul was there and he got up and he did what? He got baptized. 
That's one thing we do. It's plain and simple. We're not going to complicate this. We're not going to argue about it. This is what we see. You want to follow Jesus? You want to give your life to Jesus? You obey and you get baptized. We just read it. That's one step. And then we continue to move forward in that. Okay, that's not the be all end all. We keep moving forward. We keep growing. We keep walking together. If that's where you're at um, and you're ready to do that, please come. Please come forward. And, and, and we'll share together and we'll, get, we'll make arrangements and, and we will walk with you um, the best we can uh, as a church family. We're not perfect. We're not always good at it. We screw up all the time. We annoy each other, don't we, sometimes? Church family, no big amens. That's probably good. <laughs> but we will bang it out and we will walk together and we're going to talk about that more next week. But... Uh, uh, we love you guys. I'm going to pray, and then uh, we'll be, uh, be deployed. Father, we thank you again for this morning, and again, I thank you for each person in this room, um, each family represented. I pray a blessing on them. Um, God, help us here. I pray that we have heard. Uh, I pray that we understand. And God, I pray that just like the early church, just like Saul, just like Ananias this morning, as our examples in, in our history, of men and women who have, who, have, who have moved forward in their belief that we would have that kind of belief. Not like the rest of, of our culture or, or those, those false things, but we would really, truly, biblically believe and we would move forward in that. that. That you would do things through us and in us that have never been done. That you would do things through us and in us in this community that have never been done before. That, that men and women would be drawn to you in uh, all eyes would see you, not, not NLCC, but your Holy Spirit working in people who are goofy, broken, messed up, but forgiven and loved and who believe in that. We love you, God, and we thank you for your grace and we thank you um, for your mercy on our lives. We thank you that you do walk with us. Again, I, I pray against the lies. I pray against all the things that get in the way of that. As soon as we leave this room, and hit that parking lot um, or hit. And so may we, may we take this and use it in our lives, God. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. God, all glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You're deployed. Have an awesome week.